This time I'm looking at the Cimmerillion, and this is quite possibly the most difficult to review book I have ever read and ever done for this show. This is for several reasons. In part, due to what this book is, and in the second part, how did this book came to be. If you're not familiar with what The Cimmerillion is, I should give a primer. The Cimmerillion is J.R.R. Tolkien's mythology of Middle-earth, going from the creation myths of the world, el with elves, dwarves, humans, and how they came about, all the way through the various heroes and wars and battles that came before the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings trilogy, and then, in very brief, the events of that trilogy itself. Now, some of this material was contained in the appendices of The Return of the King, like little bits in elven language, bits in how the ring was made, but there's a lot of stuff that wasn't. Stuff like who Morgoth was, his lair of Angband, how Sauron came to serve Morgoth, how Morgoth was ultimately defeated, and how Sauron followed in Morgoth's footsteps, that sort of thing. And this book, like Lord of the Rings, is made up of three or four, depending on how you count it, smaller books, each covering a portion of Middle-earth's mythology. Part one is the creation myth. The creation of basically the world itself, the races, and several magical gemstones, which are called by the elves, the Cimmerils. Hence the title, the Silmarillion. And with this we have the coming of Morgoth and his theft of the Silmarils. Book two covers the war against Morgoth, his eventual fall, and the return of the Silmarils ultimately resulting in them due to the power they have and the, the way that through their power they cause people to lust over them the same way that they lust over the One Ring, then becoming stars in the sky. Part, the third part covers the rise of Numenor and with it also the rise of Sauron and ultimately Numenor's catastrophic fall and with it the coming of the Numenorians into the land of the main body of Middle-earth, and with it the founding of the lands of Gondor, and that sort of stuff. And the final part, part four, which is also known as the One Ring and the Coming of the Third Age, is basically the Numenorians in Middle-earth and their role in Sauron's basically threefold defeats. First at the hands of the Last Alliance in Mordor, second at the hands of the White Council in Mirkwood, and finally with the destruction of the One Ring during the War of the Rings in the advance which we saw in the Lord of the Rings. Technically, yeah, the, the, the last two parts, they are two distinct separate parts, but really, you could combine them together and they'd get one cohesive narrative. It could just easily be three books as opposed to three internal books as opposed to uh, four internal books. And this is where I get, well, into the problems of figuring out how to review this bloody thing. The Silmarillion, as a book, is shorter than the entire first volume of the Wheel of Time series. Hell, it is shorter than the Lord of the Rings series in its entirety, and it has a narrative that spans hundreds and thousands of years of time. It's shorter than the Odyssey. It's shorter than the Iliad, and its scope is bigger. It's shorter than the Old Testament of the Bible, which is the only other book that has a, has a relatable, barely, scope. And this is where the problem comes in, because there are no really cohesive characters who last the whole thing, or at least who are featured characters throughout the whole thing. The closest we get is Manwe who is basically the head god, head good god of the setting. And because they are gods, you can't necessarily humanize them. You get a span of life that's hundreds of thousands of years and phenomenal cosmic power, the ability to reshape the world. Their motivations become much less specific. Now, some of the characters who do appear in Lord of the Rings do show up, but they appear in passing. Baron and Luthien don't show up in Lord of the Rings. Uh, Elrond does. I mean, he's a supporting character in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Maybe a bit bigger role in the films. And he does appear in The Cimmerillion, but it's so much in passing. He, he is as much a witness to the amazing and wondrous events of history that appear in The Cimmerillion as he is in The Hobbit. He, pay, he takes some part, but not really that much. 
And this leads to the next problem, where there are events in this book which, on their own, have a big enough heroic story to them to fuel their own series of novels. Just the tale of Baron and Luthien could not just fuel one book the size of the Silmarillion or The Hobbit, but possibly even a full Lord of the Rings length trilogy, or Wheel of Time-esque trilogy, because it gets into... The book explicitly says that the quote-unquote lay of Luthien, a fictitious story, with sort of story within a story that comes up in relation to Silmarillion, Silmarillion is that the original work is so long that it could be ex an ex epic and it contains many stories within it of all the tasks that Baron does to earn the hand of Luthien, ultimately resulting in him getting the quest to steal a Silmaril from the crown of Morgoth. And that's just a... It's relevant to the whole broader narrative, but it's like a side bit. This is like, there's the entire whole separate war with Morgoth, which lasts for generations and generations of elves. And elves are immortal, so we have a point of, so we have a situation where elves having a generation of children, when they don't have children very often, those children coming to maturity, maturity for elves, which may be like, I don't know, a hundred years, fifty years, ninety years? And this makes the book, in many ways, one tease after another. Here's this time where the forces of Gult of Light did battle with Morgoth, and Morgoth sent forth his armies of Balrogs into the field. And here's this time where the forces Storm Angband, and Morgoth was nearly overthrown. But then his whole untold generation of dragons rose forth out of Angband, and... All seemed lost, and all these sorts of things. And here's our took millennia to clear out the deepest, darkest reaches of Angband of the people that lay within. And even then, in places, darkness lingered. It just goes on with this. And, like, all these amazing stories contained within, we're just getting capsule descriptions. It's not even, like, the full story. It's not even, like, a brief... It's not even, like, the... Um, abstract of a paper on a website, as far as a, a peer-reviewed journal paper. It's not even the abstract, like, two to three paragraph synopsis of a larger work. No, no, it's like the elevator pitch. It's, you have 15, you have, like, five seconds in an elevator, or a minute in an elevator to sell someone on a story not even a minute, like 30 seconds, to sell someone in the story in an elevator, and here's Tolkien giving you this pitch for this epic fantasy tale, and that's all you get. And this leads to the other thing is, because of all these bits, it, it fits in, on hand it fits in with the sort of fictitious meta-narrative behind The Lord of the Rings. For those who haven't read the books, or it's been a while where you've read them, Tolkien in the books, has the narrative conceit that the Lord of the Rings and the and later and later vision of The Hobbit were works that Tolkien didn't write himself, he translated. it. The Hobbit is a translated edition of There and Back Again. The Lord of the Rings is from a translation of the Red Book of Westmarch, which is the book, which is a sort of expanded version of The Hobbit that that's the one that Samwise takes up, where we get Frodo, we get Bilbo writing there and back again, A Hobbit's Holiday, and then we have Frodo going on after that, adding in of the Lord of the Rings, and so on. In fact, you actually, if you've seen the extended edition of the films, you kind of get some of this, where you see Bilbo writing there and back again, you have Frodo then, after his journeys, writing his writing the story of the Lord of the Rings, and then passing that book on to Samwise to continue with the story of the Hobbits and that sort of thing. And we have the Red Book of Westmarch. And that's what, and Tolkien's working off that. And so theoretically, you have the meta narrative idea of, okay, this is other sources of research that Tolkien came across, maybe from the long preserved library of the Baggins family or the Gamgee family or this is a separate history that Bilbo or Frodo prepared while they were at a time after the War of the Rings in Rivendell to preserve a history of what happened before Elrond and all of them go off to the Grey Havens and leave this world forever. That sort of thing. 
And all of this is conscribed, is, is this meta narrative transcribed and edited together into this historical document translated into English by J.R.R. Tolkien. And this is why there are all these gaps and little filly bits here is because some stories that these stories are missing. We have descriptions of these stories and how big they are from other sources, but we don't have the whole thing, which is interesting from a mythological standpoint and keeps the Silmarillion from going to like this one book about you know, about the size of like The Hobbit, maybe a little bigger, into like this big massive multi-volume set. I said, even that description I just gave came with an asterisk, because this book isn't exclusively the work of J.R.R. It's also the work of his son, Christopher. J.R.R. worked in the Silmarillion for most of his career, actually starting from the completion of The Hobbit on, off and on, and during this time also working on Lord of the Rings, particularly after he pitched the Silmarillion to his editor, and his editor basically said, no, we want something more like The Hobbit, this is way too dry. And hence we get the Lord of the Rings, which is basically wrapping up the arc of the Silmarillion, which he then wants to go back and fill in later. However, even then, he never finished it. J.R.R. never finished the Silmarillion. Thus, his son Christopher edited all his notes and put them together in a cohesive narrative and made sure everything had continuity with the Ho with the revised version of The Hobbit, which included the correct riddle game and that sort of stuff, and the Lord of the Rings... And in it's a, in other words, it's a lot like the fictional narrative explanation for how the Silmarillion came about in the first place. On the one hand, this is in a way incredibly appropriate, because we have a situ circumstance where the narrative behind the creation of the book, the fictional narrative behind the creation of the book, or you might say the Watsonian explanation behind the creation of the book, maps with the Doyleist narrative behind the creation of the book. Quick explanation as an aside. Watsonianism and Doyleism, when it comes to literary analysis, comes from the Sherlock Holmes novels, at least you can, at least you can notice from the names, because the Sherlock Holmes stories are theoretically created from a narrative written by Dr. Watson and published in a magazine describing the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, which leads to the question when you're doing discuss literary analysis, discussion of the works, is this something that Watson specifically chose to include? or omit, or change, or a continuity decision that was deliberately made by Watson, versus one that was made by Doyle, and just due to him forgetting some Doyle as the author forgetting something, or was he perhaps being more clever or ingenious? And this is the circumstance here with the Silmarillion, is we get these gaps of information and knowledge, and we get the question here of, is this information omitted because, because J.R.R.? wanted to omit it as deliberate choice on his part and something he planned to expand on later or is this something uh, I think the point there is is, is this a deliberate decision on J.R.R.'s part where he's planning to round this out later or did he never plan to round it out at all and it's just the the implication of a larger work of the poem of Baron and Luthien of the poem of the children of Hurin are those did he plan to plan to round those out or did he just referencing them for the sake of referencing them to make the world seem a little bit larger? Now, we've gotten the Children of Huron. Apparently, there is a, sh a partially complete version of Baron and Luthien. It's not the full-size massive epic, but it's a big thing. And he's, it's out there and he's collected by Christopher Tolkien and other collections of his father's papers. The closest we've gotten to actual expansion of these, though, is probably the book Children of Huron, which was published nine years ago. Which again, taking J.R.R.'s work, putting it together, expanding on it, adjusting it as necessary into a, so it makes for a proper cohesive narrative by Christopher. Um, unfortunately, the story of Baron and Luthien, which is just as engrossing, if not more so, has gotten no such treatment with instead, since the release of Children of Huron, Christopher focusing mostly on J.R.R.'s translation of epic poetry, uh, his version of Beowulf, his version of a few other major epic poems. So, this leads to my, to the ultimate question which any review must ask, and particularly with work like this. Is the Silmarillion something you should read? And the answer is, that depends. If, after reading The Lord of the Rings, did you find yourself wanting more? And w if with that more, are you okay with the fact that 
this, that, that the more will just fuel your hunger ever more for even more stories, and you aren't necessarily going to get them. You're not going to get the answers to the questions you want. Then if so, dig in. If you just want to know more about the world of Lord of the Rings, its history and mythology, and you're okay with those gaps, then go for it. If you thought the Lord of the Rings could have gone more in depth, like the book, the original trilogy could have gotten more in depth in terms of its narrative and its narrative beats and fleshing out characters and descriptions of events and actions and that sort of thing, if you feel that Tolkien overdrove, trem, over generalized the event that's going on, the internal thoughts and the minds of the characters, then this will probably make you more infuriated and upset. If only because you're getting even less information in the Silmarillion than you got in the Lord of the Lord of the Wings, with more going on over the length of the entire series, the entire book. If you also, if you're planning on running a tabletop role-playing game in the Lord of the Rings, Silmarillion is definitely worth picking up just to flesh out the mythology and maybe find some good time periods to set your campaign. But if you want maps and other stuff. You're probably going to want to pick up the Atlas of Middle-Earth, although the Silmarillion has a massive catastrophic event that changes the Atlas of Middle-Earth. And I don't know if the information is incorporated in the Atlas of Middle-Earth. There are old tabletop role-playing materials for the um, Middle-Earth role-playing game, but I don't know how much of that gets into Silmarillion stuff at first, and, what, and phases of the Silmarillion. I think the one thing, I, the biggest thing I take a, I'm take Taking away from the Silmarillion after reading it, or at least it's an audiobook, but still it's reading, is I kind of wish, in a way, that even either Middle Earth either went into the public domain or Christopher Tolkien opened it up for author other authors like Christopher Tolkien himself and maybe his son or one of the other uh, uh, J.R.R.'s other sons who would take over the Tolkien estate after Christopher's passing would open it up so that other writers can look at the Silmarillion and flesh out these bits. It won't be the same as if J.R.R. does it. It would never be the same as if J.R.R. did it. But there's just these events, these stories that I'd want to see told. And like, even just a snippet, even just a little side story in context of this bigger narrative. Like, Brian Sanderson writing about the scourging of Angband. Or anything like that. Um, would be amazing. Or even, I don't know which fantasy writer who would want to do this, but it, someone with the right chops finally telling the story of Baron and Luthien in full, how they, like, describing how they meet, describing the labors that, the, the almost Herculean labors that Baron goes through, not for, to redeem himself as Hercules did, but basically as that his dowry for himself to show that he is worthy of marrying Luthien. That sort of stuff would be would be great stories to tell. And until that day comes, the Silmarillion is what we got. So that's what we'll have to settle with. <laughs> Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention of the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. 
Once again, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.